Great, thank you. And uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, joining Fish and Richardson today for our latest patent series webinar, uh, as entitled, A Potpourri of Alice, Decisions Across Jurisdictions as Guides to Eligibility, or as my uh, six-year-old daughter tried to pronounce it out the other day, A, a Potpourri of Alice. Um, so my name is Ryan McCarthy, as you've just been introduced. I'm a principal in Fish's Austin office. And you can, uh, I believe, view my biography on the side of your screen. Uh, so today's webinar is planned for about 60 minutes, and we'll include a question and answer period at the end of the program. Uh, as noted, you can submit questions during the program, and I'll do my best to answer those. Um, as we all know, this is a pretty uh, kind of a hot, confusing topic, so I would expect a lot of questions. I'll do my best to answer as we go through the webinar. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I want to also note that, um, you know, for questions that aren't answered today, uh, I'll try and stay on a little longer to answer any additional questions and or uh, feel free to contact me or some of my colleagues who I'll introduce you to as we go through the presentation uh, after the presentation uh, directly and we can help answer questions uh, at the end. Um, for any CLE questions or technical issues, uh, please contact Crystal Chisholm at the email address that I believe is provided on your screen. Um, as another note, materials will be made available on FISH's website and our patent webinar series page after today's presentation. So if you want to re-listen to it because it's pretty exciting stuff or want to share it with uh, colleagues, um, those materials will be available. Um, before we jump into the, the detail, I just want to remind everybody that the content of this presentation is for educational purposes only and does not necessarily reflect the opinions of FISH and Richardson and also is not intended to address every situation. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and begin the presentation. Uh, we're going to cover a series of topics here. Here's a quick agenda overview of the webinar series quickly, background, cases in context, which will make sense in a little bit, cases in context, uh, and then we have these three uh, contexts that we'll, we'll be talking about. Uh, section 8 towards the end will be the takeaways, and what about all the other cases that we didn't get a chance to talk about today? <laughs> So overview of the webinar series, so as uh, many of you may have already participated in, FISH gives a uh, regular uh, webinar series on different topics. This happens to be our patent webinar series. Uh, the topics generally talk about important decisions, developments, and practice tips in view of the things that are going on uh, within the, the practice. Uh, we also have other housekeeping things, uh, cover CLE, as you'll all get CLE, I believe, today. Um, questions and materials. And again, there's a hyperlink there that you can click on to go to our webinar series and uh, get some more information on that. So with that, uh, what we're here today to talk about, obviously, is Alice and the havoc it's been wreaking uh, both in the prosecution and the litigation side and where things uh, are kind of going given all the different decisions across the various jurisdictions. So uh, I presume that everybody here today uh, has an understanding or a fundamental understanding of what Alice is about. Um, but I wanted to give a bit of a background just to provide a, a base context for the rest of the discussion. So what we're really here today to talk about is patent eligibility, which uh, finds its statutory footings in 35 U.S.C. 101. And that uh, statute really outlines the categories of patent eligible subject matter. And those are a process, machine, manufacturer, composition of matter, or any new and useful improvement thereof. So there's the first statutory question, or the first question really in determining patent eligibility, before we even get to anything else, <clears throat> is, the, is the claim directed to one of these statutory categories? For example, is it a method? Is it a machine? Or is it an apparatus? Now with those, and really the point we're here for, is that there's actually exceptions to uh, these categories or the statutory, statutory categories of subject matter that's patent eligible. And these, I think we're all well-versed in, are laws of nature, physical, natural phenomena, and abstract ideas. And so uh, ALICE is really about the third of these three exceptions to patent eligibility, and that is the abstract ideas. And in particular, uh, the software realm has been hit uh, with ALICE, and ALICE was focused on software. Uh, but to really be clear, ALICE wasn't about software per se. ALICE was about patent eligibility of abstract ideas. It's just that software really is susceptible to being accused of you know, protecting or being really about abstract ideas or encapsulating abstract ideas. And so that's really been kind of the focus of, of uh, everything that's come after ALICE, whether it's at the district courts or at the PTAB. So moving on, uh, and just to kind of set the base, I think we all also may be aware of the two-part test that ALICE 
uh, took or didn't really take, but it's the Mayo test that uh, Mayo dealt with the, the kind of the other exceptions. Alice is dealing with the abstract idea exceptions. Uh, so Alice took the, the, the two-part test of Mayo, which, as we all may be aware, is, you know, the first step is, is the claimed claim directed to a patent ineligible concept. Is it directed to an abstract idea? Uh, if it is, if, you, if the answer to step one is yes, then you go on to step two. So if yes, do the claims elements both individually and in the combination transform the nature of the claims into a patent eligible application of the abstract idea, abstract concept? Um, and then here's a little quote for, from uh, Alice citing Mayo that really kind of drives that home. It's the search for an inventive concept being an element or a combination of elements that is sufficient to ensure the patent in practice amounts to significantly, significantly more than a patent upon the abstract idea itself. So really what we're looking for, uh, and I want to point out a couple more quotes from Alice uh, that I think are going to be germane to the discussion later, and I'll, I'll be referring back to these. Um, but really the, the main concern here with abstract ideas being uh, covered in claims is preemption. And are the claims looking to wholly preempt this abstract idea? Uh, however, there's got to be kind of careful with that. Uh, as, as Alice noted, citing Mayo, Deere, and Benson, we tread carefully in construing this exclusionary principle lest it swallow all of patent law. An invention is not rendered ineligible for patents simply because it involves an abstract concept. Applications of such concepts to a new and useful end, we have said, remain eligible for patent protection. And I, I read that purposefully because I think you'll see in a, in a decision or two that we're going to talk about today, there are some decisions that I think are sliding down that slippery slope to swallowing all of patent law. Uh, so the basic idea really is in imply, applying the 101 exception to abstract ideas, we have to distinguish claims that are really claiming the building blocks, the, the abstract idea itself, uh, versus something more that the patent eligible application. Because if you have a patent eligible application of those, there's no comparable risk of preemption. And that's noted in the last quote from Alice. So I just wanted to set those three uh, quotes up uh, because I think it'll provide some further context and make sense of some of the decisions we're going to talk about in a little bit. So moving on, cases and context. So here we have a list of various cases that we've kind of plucked out across various jurisdictions. We looked at federal circuit, some district court cases, the Court of Federal Claims, and the PTAB, of course, because we're fighting Alice on all fronts, whether you're a defendant or a plaintiff, whether you're pro-patent, pro uh, software patent or against, um, you're seeing decisions across all these jurisdictions. And different jurisdictions are coming out with different decisions for different reasons. Even at the district court level, uh, different district courts are handling things differently than other district courts. And as a note uh, here, I wanted to, we had a, a question um, that was submitted ahead of the call, and it asked about statistics with respect to uh, motions in litigation. So this would be at the district court level. Um, there are some statistics published in August uh, that showed that I think nationwide about 70% of motions to dismiss or motions for summary judgment of uh, ineligibility, so the claims falling under Alice, were granted about 70% of the time and about another 30% uh, were denied. So that's, na that's a national statistic. However, if you look at local jurisdictions, the Eastern District of Texas in particular, they have that a bit flipped. <clears throat> they show uh, statistics that were about 25 to 30% are actually being granted, whereas plaintiffs are you know, making their way through these motions uh, about 70% of the time. In other districts, 50-50, 90-10. Um, so th those, again, those statistics are from, uh, I think, about a month or so ago. The recent decisions we've been seeing coming out, which have been over the last couple days, even the last couple weeks, I think uh, still are in line with those those statistics. So with that, uh, just to get back to uh, the jurisdictions and the cases that we've selected in this slide, uh, the as you as I think we're all aware, there have been hundreds of decisions coming out of various jurisdictions on Alice. Uh, so here's a very small sampling of those, some that we again show is because we think they're really they really contribute to the conversation on where things are headed and what's really eligible nowadays and, and how are the courts landing on things. There's a lot of cases that we don't have in here because we don't believe that they really contribute to the conversation. They tend to be claims that were really questionable in the first place. They're kind of, you know, 
palm to the forehead. Why were they even asserted? They probably weren't even valid under Bilski. Um, so some of those uh, cases we haven't really bothered to to address um, just because we didn't think they were really contributing to the ultimate question of, of where we had it, what's eligible nowadays. Um, so with these uh, cases, we've you know done us a uh, kind of review of, of all the hundreds of cases and really broken down things with respect to software in three different types of contexts. And so this slide is really kind of the three contexts or models I've been calling them also. Um, that you see claims that involve software, inventions that involve software tend to fall into. These are what I have dubbed the tangible, the intangible, where you have technology as a necessity, and intangible, where technology is really just the implementation. So the tangible side, and these actually kind of go in order of uh, what I believe are lower uh, hurdles to eligibility. I think the tangible claims are probably the easiest under eligibility, although you will see in the slides we, we talk about in a few minutes that it's not always the case. Uh, intangible are probably the middle hurdle that's, uh, and, and then the, inten sorry, the intangible technology as necessity is probably the middle hurdle, and the intangible technology as implementation are probably the toughest cases. And that's where you're seeing most of the claims falling, whether it's at the PTAB, district courts, or even the Fed Circuit. So tangible, really this is about claims, processes, systems, whatever the statutory category is, that really affects or are affected by a real-world tangible output or input. There's something there that you can grasp on, you can feel. Even though software is involved, there's something tangible about it. Uh, and so those are really things that are outside of what I believe are can really be classified as being claims to an abstract idea as a whole. The intangible technology is a necessity. Uh, really are a process that uh, affect a virtual outcome. But these are things that really could not exist outside of a technological environment. These are not some kind of fundamental truths or processes that could have existed at any point in human history, maybe even before you know, the pre-internet era. These are things that couldn't exist without this technological environment. Uh, the intangible technologies implementation are a bit of the opposite of that. that those are the cases that I, I believe are really the true abstract idea cases that, you know, as a matter of choice are being implemented in technology. And we're going to talk about these, provide a little more clear examples of each of these in a minute. Um, but they aren't things that could not have existed before um, at any point in human history. They're, they're not things that could not have existed in the pre-internet era. Uh, and again, this, these will be clarified as we, as we continue to go through these slides. So we want to now take the cases we talked about above, the, the, the small sampling that I presented a couple slides ago, and place them into each of these contexts. So the first context we have is the tangible. And this is what I've been referring to as the DEER model. So these are, and, and as we all may be aware, that you know the Alice decision and, and its progeny, Mayo and all that before that, were based on several cases, DEER, Benson, Fluke. Um, this DEER model, uh, and I'll talk about it in a minute, uh, is really kind of the tangible things that, yeah, it involves mathematical formula or some abstract uh, idea, but there's some tangible aspect to the claims that really take it out of abstraction and make it patent eligible. So here's the sampling from uh, the various district courts in the PTAB um, of claims. We're not going to talk about all of them. But we've picked a, a selection of some of these, again, for time purposes, but also we picked a selection to show how these claims and these decisions fit within this model and or sometimes they don't fit within this model. They've been squeezed into another model by a court. We'll see some claims like that or some uh, decisions like that in a couple slides, but they really should be in a different model. So I'll, talk, I'll clarify that in a little bit. Um, so that is the tangible is really what I'm calling the DEER model. Uh, the intangible technology is a necessity is really the DDR model. I think we're all aware of the DDR decision, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But these, again, are, are claims or uh, decisions, uh, subject matter, that really fit to the decision of DDR, saying that, look, the underlying, although it maybe includes an abstract idea, maybe it doesn't, but anyways, the underlying technology that this is embodied in is really a necessity for this to even exist. So here's a sampling of the various uh, cases across various district courts um, that we're going to talk about. Again, a few of these, not all of them uh, for time purposes. Uh, but again, I'd be happy to discuss any particular case after, after we're done today. Finally, uh, the intangible technology as implementation is what I'm calling the ultra model, which could just as well be called the Alice model. 
Um, I think I chose DDR and Ultramercial because they seem to really be the, the two Fed circuit cases that, you know, lie on either side of the spectrum. And, you know, if, you're, if, you, if you really want patent eligibility, get your claims over to, over to DDR. If you want uh, ineligibility, you want to push them towards Ultramercial. Uh, and again, there's a sampling of cases. We won't talk about all of them. So I do want to note that uh, the ultra-mercial model, the, the, the decisions that kind of fall in that area, uh, there's a lot of them. And my slide a few slides ago, you know, was kind of short on decisions. Uh, as I noted, there's hundreds of them. Um, we have only really been picking decisions, again, that we really feel contribute to the conversation that we can point to and show that we're going to really learn something out of. A lot of the ultra-mercial model type claims, decisions, uh, they, they kind of really uh, deal with patents that are, were really questionable to begin with. Some of these patents that really kind of, I think, created the whole you know, concern in the first place that led to, led to Alice and some of the patent reform um, you know, legislation and things. Uh, so there, you look at some of those claims, and they're really no-brainers. They just look, they're just poorly, poorly written, maybe, um, and uh, just really don't really offer much. Um, and so probably even failed under Bilski originally, but they just happen to be now knocked out under Alice in a lot of these decisions. So, anyways, my point in telling you that is, although they're ultra-mercial model uh, decisions, we we're only showing a few here. There's actually a lot more but we just feel that some of those don't really contribute to the conversation. So with that, uh, we're going to talk about now the tangible category. This is going to be our deer model claims. And we're going to talk about some decisions that really, you know, we'll, I'll talk about the deer decision first and then some other decisions that really got it right and that I believe got it wrong, um, but still fit within the deer model. So the first uh, thing just to kind of set the stage is deer. I think a lot of people may be familiar with deer. Uh, this was directed to a method of operating a molding press, um, and so this really had to deal with calculating different parameters and comparing parameters, and once you saw that these certain parameters uh, were equal, then you would actually physically open a rubber molding press for, for curing rubber. Um, it's really interesting, and I want to point this out to kind of distinguish a, a decision, a subsequent decision. Uh, the claim in, in Deere explicitly recited the Arrhenius equation. The claim actually said you calculate this parameter using the Arrhenius equation and then actually gave you the equation. So the decision in Deere really set the forth that, you know, mathematical formulas in the abstract are not eligible for patents, so you couldn't just patent the Arrhenius equation or just use of it to calculate a value. But this physical application makes pushes it to eligibility. So this last claim feature, the in quotes there in the last bullet point, um, is right from the claim. It's the last feature, and really I think pushes uh, Deer to eligibility. And it's opening the press automatically when said comparison indicates equivalence. So there, I think kind of the overall rule I'm extracting from Deer is abstract, but it's a real-world tangible outcome. Therefore, we have eligibility. So let's look at a couple of decisions, uh, recent ones, that I think fit the Deere model, got it right, and got it wrong. So we'll start with uh, Chamberlain Group v. Linear. Uh, this came out earlier this year in July, and this was uh, Judge St. Eve is uh, ruling on a motion to dismiss under 12b-6. Uh, there's multiple patents involved here, um, some that were directed to monitoring a movable barrier um, and monitoring an alarm systems. Uh, I put two of the claims here. I hope uh, you can see them well. They're not as clear in my presentation as, a, uh, as they were when I was working on it. Uh, but the first claim, claim number 12, is really uh, about checking the status of a movable barrier, a movable barrier, excuse me, and then also being able to control the movement of the barrier in response to a status change request. Uh, the other claims are the alarm system claims, where you have uh, use of an intrusion detection alarm system for communicating with a garage door opener. And again, these movable barriers in the context of the patent applications were really about garage doors. So you can imagine Chamberlain garage door opener company. Um, the court here found the claims patent eligible. And again, I believe that's uh, you know, under the DEER model. Uh, monitoring this is some uh, clips from the, from the decisions themselves. Uh, the monitoring claims, so we have the monitoring and the alarm, alarm system. Uh, the monitoring claims have a clear, concrete, and tangible form in that they are directed to monitoring and opening and closing a movable barrier, a particular tangible form. So there, the claims actually, even though they're method claims, like DEER, they included this tangible, real-world outcome. 
uh, and the alarm system claim is very similar. Uh, claimed alarm system is more than an abstract idea as the patents disclose the monitoring of process variables and the means of setting off an alarm or adjusting an alarm system. So here they're saying it's more than an abstract idea in and of itself uh, because of these tangible outcomes. So this is a case that I believe really kind of got it right using the DEER model and fits in the DEER model. Now we're going to now move on to a case that, in my view, in many people's view, although not, not everybody I work with agrees with me on this one, but uh, got it wrong, and that's the Thales Visionics case. Excuse me. Um, so Thales is an interesting case, and it's about pretty interesting high-tech technology. Um, as just noted from the outcome or out, outset, uh, the claims here were deemed ineligible. This dealt with uh, system claims and method claims. I'm going to focus on the system claims instead of the method claims because I think this kind of really drives home kind of my problem with Thales and why I think the court got it wrong here. In general, uh, Thales is directed to using inertial trackers to track motion relative to a moving platform instead of relative to the earth. So. It really uh, has to do with uh, helmet-mounted display systems for fighter pilots, for example. So fighter pilots within their helmets could see tactical information about weapons and targets and things, regardless of which way they're, they're, they were facing within the, within the jet. And so to do that, it had uh, sensors mounted on different parts of the jet, on the helmet and then the jet itself. Um, and the, the difference here over the prior art was that uh, the had tracking motion relative to a moving platform being the jet instead of the earth. The prior art systems used the frame of reference as the earth. Um, so there was a helmet with respect to where the earth was. Uh, and so what the, the one claim that fell, the system claim, uh, is really about tracking. It's a system for tracking the motion of an object relative to a moving reference frame. And so here it recites actually two concrete real-world things. A first inertial sensor mounted on the tracked object. So we have one sensor being mounted on a particular object. And we have a second inertial sensor being mounted on a moving reference frame. So we have two sensors mounted on two concrete things. And then, of course, you have this element that's adapted to re receive signals, process the signals to determine the orientation of the object relative to the moving reference frame. So in finding these claims ineligible, uh, the court held that the claims are directed to a mathematical equations for determining the relative position of a moving object to the reference frame. Although a complex mathematical concept and a solution to, per, to the problem of tracking two moving objects in relation to the other, the solution lies in the mathematical formula, not the generic devices listed in the system claim. So I kind of take exception to that because, you know, as we just kind of noted in DEER, DEER actually in the claim recited an equation. It, it recited the Arrhenius equation, it required the Arrhenius equation, and actually gave you the Arrhenius equation within the claim. This claim, the system claim, doesn't mention the word equation, doesn't have any type of equation. All it says is you have this element that gets the signals, processes the signal to determine the orientation. Uh, the claim fails to transform the method into a patent eligible invention, describing generic fungible inertial sensors that admittedly have already gained widespread acceptance in the field of motion. I had a problem with this, too, because I think that gets us, and I put the quote down below, down that slippery slope where we tread carefully in construing these ex this exclusionary principle left it swallow all of patent law. To me, in this decision, the judge took a leap to say, well, yeah, it's a system that's tangible. I mean, this system, if I was the plaintiff, I probably would have brought the system, the physical system, in and set it on the judge's desk and said, look, this is not abstract. You can touch the sensors. You can feel them. Here's the helmet. Here's the reference frame. But the judge seemed to take the leap here where Alice talked about, you know, if you implement software just on a generic computer, that's not going to push it to eligibility. Now the judge here is taking that, well, let's, let's not just limit the generic characterization to computers, but let's now look at other physical things. The sensor, well, those are generic sensors. So now we're not going to, you know, let non-abstractness exist with things that are known or now are generic. So this brings me kind of to the slippery slope argument where things, you know, if you had a patent to, for example, a transmission for a vehicle, those all use gears, levers, pulleys, those are, you know, and nowadays would seem generic components. Although if they're put together in a new and not obvious way, you should have, you know, a patent on those. Um, going down the slope, anything that involves generic components 
wouldn't necessarily a lot rise to the level of eligibility, even though they're not abstract, they're kind of concrete things. Um, so anyways, the overall story here is I think sales uh, visionics, at least to the system claim, got it, got it wrong um, and for the reasons I just discussed. Uh, so I think if you're going to be dealing with this uh, type of claim, uh, you really want to drive some of those points home, the, the tangibility of it and that you can actually physically touch it, feel it, um, and that it really fits more into the deer model. So another one that came out recently is can rig drilling technology. And again, I think this is another one that got it right. Now we did also have some internal debate about this, but I, I believe this is uh, this one got it right. Uh, this is a 12C uh, motion for judgment on the pleadings. This is Judge Atlas. Uh, the defendant was arguing that the abstract idea here was rotational movement, that the claims were trying to preempt rotational movement, um, which seems really overly abstract just on its face. Um, the, the subject matter here was directed to directional drilling, which presents two significant challenges, one accurately steering, steering the drill path uh, of the well and two overcoming friction inherent in the drilling process. So what we're talking about here is drilling wells. So I'm here in Texas. We hear a lot about this. And this had to do with, uh, I believe, slant drilling. So instead of drilling uh, a well straight down, you can drill wells in different directions. So you can steer the steer the drill bit through the rock bed and, and go in different directions. And to do that, uh, you know, there's lots of different problems uh, because of bits wearing out and friction and, and other issues that arise. And so Canrig came up with some technology uh, to improve upon that. And here you see the drilling method. It's mon monitoring the rotation of the drill string using sensors, transmitting the rotational information to the computer, now controlling the motor that rotates the drill string, and rotating drill string to a predetermined angle based on that information. Uh, so here, to me, this is a method claim, but it's more of the deer model that really has a real-world output. You're actually controlling a motor that's driving a drill string. Uh, so the court here got it right. Um, and again, I think the the uh, defendant's um, characterization of the abstract idea as being preempted as rotational movement was a little overly, was a little uh, ambitious uh, with respect to breadth. Uh, so the court noted that the claims in Canary's patents address specific challenges in directional drilling through a concrete process for controlling the rotation of the long drilling drills and between predetermined angles. Uh, and again, they actually even pointed to deer. Uh, so this again fits, I think, within the Deer model, shows eligibility, and uh, that's really kind of why I think that the Deer model is probably the easier for eligibility. If you can put your claims into the Deer model and you, and you want eligibility, um, I'm assuming you're the plaintiff, for example, or you're you know you're prosecuting a patent at the patent office. Uh, if you can fit that into this model, I think uh, it really works in your favor towards eligibility. Um, so let's move on to the next one. Uh, We've been doing cases across different jurisdictions. I wanted to get some PTAB cases in here too, because you know Alice isn't just affecting us in court dealing with motions, either you know getting motions to dismiss or defending against motions to dismiss. Um, but they are uh, also at the PTAB, whether it's in view of an examiner rejection. I'm prosecuting a patent at the patent office. I have to deal with an examiner and who is just not relenting on their rejection, whether regardless of how ridiculous it is or not. And a lot of that has to do, um, without getting off, off onto a tangent, a lot of it has to do with the lack of direction examiners have been given at the patent office, which we, you know, as, as patent practitioners, anyway, have to deal with on a, every day. But ultimately, you know, when we're looking at those types of uh, rejections, we're going to appeal to the PTAB. Uh, also, as we're all aware, post-grant practice has boomed in the last couple of years. And so the PTAB is considering, you know, things, uh, particularly, uh, you know, in the CBM realm anyway, uh, eligibility. Uh, that's where you see the, the eligibility challenges. This is under a covered business method review. Um, and so we wanted to make sure we're, we're talking about how the PTAP's handling things. Here's an interesting case that I think fits the DEER model. Uh, unfortunately, the PTAP decisions tend not to be as uh, verbose as some of the district court decisions, so we're kind of left with a little bit, you know, scratching our head. Um, but anyways, this is this case is ex parte Palmer, and this dealt with a card game that incorporates rules and scoring to simulate playing of a sporting event. So if you're playing a, a football game, there's a way to use cards to to kind of mimic that sporting event. And here I, I've posted the claim. It's really a method for playing the game. Uh, the PTAB found these claims eligible, uh, and it really largely had to do with the cards. They noted that 
hey, there is an abstract idea here. We view a method of playing a card game as being akin to a method of organizing human activity um, at issue in Alice. But these claims here actually recite a particular you know, deck of cards with a high degree of particularity. They specify a particular makeup of the deck and include the number of cards contained in the deck and unique card markings. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, if, if ex parte Palmer got it 100% right, but this really is to show, and then the reason I chose this uh, to include in the presentation was to really show how, you know, you can fit these, you know, even on the patent prosecution side into the DEER model and push for eligibility. Uh, so here, for example, we have the, this physical, tangible deck of cards that's, you know, defined in the claim as pushing uh, the claims or convincing the PTAB anyway uh, that the claim should be patent eligible. So that's my kind of overview of cases for uh, what we're calling the tangible model, the DEER model. Uh, so we're going to now move on to the intangible uh, technology as a necessity <coughs> model. And this <coughs> model is really modeled after the DDR decision. And really kind of the, the foundational idea of this model is, yeah, maybe the claims include some abstract idea Maybe they don't, but is the subject matter fundamentally rooted? And I, I hate to keep using that term because that's the that's the quote from from DDR. But this subject matter could not even exist outside of a technological environment. It's not some fundamental truth that could have existed at any point in human history. It couldn't have existed, you know, before the under tech, underlying technology existed. So there was some point in time where the technology had to exist for this idea or this subject matter to really even be. Use or just to even exist. Uh, so the obvious quote um, from uh, DDR, which we've probably all heard a hundred times and we all use in our briefs and things, are is that you know the claim solution is necessarily rooted in computer technology in order to overcome a problem specifically arising in the realm of computer networks. And just to step back for a second, what was DDR about? DDR was about providing a hybrid web page. So the problem there was actually a business problem, and, and I noted that in the slides as a business challenge, which was retaining web uh, site visitors at your site. So uh, if somebody was viewing your site and they wanted to click on a sponsor link, uh, link to advertising or sponsor, the user would be navigated away to a different web page, and sometimes they don't come back. And so you lose this retention of people on your website. They came up with the idea, DDR, of in the response to uh, a user selecting the link, instead of navigating away from your website, you they create a hybrid web page that has the look and feel of the sponsor's web page, but still your web page. Put it together and present that to uh, the user. So, a DDR kind of punted on the abstract idea question. Uh, they, I think they noted, hey, you know, abstract ideas, you know, from Alice and all the other ones, they're really kind of hard to define. Uh, but anyways, they noted that, look, there's no preemption because this, these claims were cited a specific way to automate the creation of a composite web page by an outsourced provider that incorporates elements from multiple sources in order to solve a problem faced by websites on the Internet. So DDR basically said, look, this problem that they're dealing with couldn't have existed in the pre-Internet era, and the solution they came up with has to be rooted in this technology and websites and in, in, in the Internet um, to even exist. And so here, I think there's an argument that that makes this not abstract. But anyways, as the court noted, there's there's no preemption because it's really rooted in technology. So here's the kind of overall rule. Uh, I've kind of extracted a high level at the bottom. Cannot be divorced from technical environment means it's eligible. So let's look at some uh, patents that kind of fit the DDR model. Uh, the first one I'm going to look at is the messaging gateway solutions. Um, this is from last April. And this was the District of Delaware, Judge Andrews. <laughs> the defession, uh, excuse me, defendant's motion uh, for judgment on the pleadings, uh, and it was denied. I think the plaintiff had had a cross motion for eligibility, and that was granted. Um, so, messaging gateway solutions was really about a method for facilitating two-way communication between a mobile device and an internet server. And you can see uh, the claim here, uh, one of the claims, one of the representative claims, a method for using a computer system to facilitate two-way communication. Some of the features, the computer system receiving a text message from a first communication path and then converting the test or inserting a message body. And I think there's some conversion and translation here. I don't want to read through the whole claim, uh, but really just kind of get to the point of what the court had to say in, in finding these claims eligible. They did find that this was directed to an abstract idea. 
and that abstract idea was translation. The court said that the claim is a method that enables a device that ordinarily cannot send a message to a different device to do so. That is essentially the same as a translator, excuse me, a translator assisting two people who speak different languages to communicate to each other. I think there's an argument that that's probably uh, an over overbroad uh, reading of what's going on in the claim, but that's okay because they found it eligible under the second step. They saw that this claim is necessarily rooted in computer technology in order to overcome a problem specifically arising in the realm of computer networks, again, pointing to DDR. Uh, noting that Claim 20 is directed to a problem unique to text message telecommunications between a mobile device and a computer. And here's kind of one of my next favorite quotes that I, that I use a lot in briefs to the Patent Office. The solution it provides is tethered to the technology that created the problem. So again, I think Messaging Gateway is a good example of the DDR model where we see technology uh, or the idea, the subject matter, can't be divorced from the technology. It's something that couldn't have existed without that technology. So, you know, pre-devices uh, communicating with each other over a network, this subject matter, this claim, at least claim 20, could not have existed, hence patent eligibility. Uh, the next case uh, is an intellectual ventures case, the JP Morgan that came out uh, a little while after the, <coughs> the um, the messaging gateway case we just spoke about. This is April of this year. And this is one that I think fits into the DDR model um, and was found ineligible under 101 Alice. This is one that I personally feel that maybe the court got it wrong, and I'll explain why in a minute. But uh, this is really directed uh, to the, the claims here were directed to uh, preventing malware from getting through a firewall and infecting your computer. So detecting, preventing entry of a packet containing malware. Uh, and so it's really about controlling access to and use of digital property after primary distribution to an authorized user. Uh, this was out of the Southern District of New York um, and with Judge Hellerstein. And I think there's actually three patents involved, uh, one that allows filtering systems to identify threats based upon information that may have been strategically fragmented and hidden in multiple packets. So before this invention, um, single packets would come through and malware could be in any individual packet. And then once, you know, the technology figured that out and they came up with systems to, to identify those threats and filter them out, um, you, uh, the, the, the malicious users that were trying to infect computers got smarter and they started fragmenting their payloads into multiple packets. So this IV invention came up with a way to now detect that across multiple packets that were coming in and filter those out. Uh, the court, however, deemed the claims as being directed to a mental process. Um, I kind of have a, they, they actually, I think, uh, defined, they had a claim construction for PAC, and I just want to find it quickly because it really kind of works against the mental process. Uh, they defined, uh, patent, or sorry, a packet as a discrete unit of information being routed through a computer network, often to a designated addressee, and that was a, a claim construction order the court had previously issued. But they still say the claim of the patent amounts to a mental process. I, uh, I'm not sure how a, a person could mentally receive um, a packet defined as such, uh, but, you know, that's neither here nor there now. Uh, so, and the court notes that there's nothing concrete to make the patent eligible for protection. A computer does not convert a mental process into something more com concrete. To me, kind of as I've high level described the subject matter, um, but you know, obviously the, the, the specification goes into much more detail, this subject matter really couldn't be divorced from underlying technology. This isn't something that was an issue, you know, pre-internet, pre uh, computers talking to each other and malware being able to be infected on, uh, you know, through firewalls and things. Uh, so that's kind of why I felt that this one really fits the DDR model and the court got it wrong is that the subject matter here couldn't be divorced from the under underlying technology. Uh, and I'm just going to kind of speed things up a little bit just because uh, I think of uh, the time constraints. Uh, the next one uh, is about, um, uh, again, another DDR one. This is Klaus Tech v. AdMob, and this actually had to deal with Internet advertising. Uh, so this is a good kind of subject matter for, you know, I think a lot of people would read that and go, oh, that sounds, you know, maybe abstract or not eligible. 
Um, but this is really about internet advertising with controlled and timed display of ad content from a centralized system controller. And this is not uh, directed to non-scrolling ad display from a website. And basically, it really defines when and where and how long this ad content from this non-scrolling ad frame would be presented. Uh, so that's a high level of that. The court held that eligible. Um, one, they, you know, they had this comment about motion to dismiss when they would be appropriate. I'm going to skip through that real quickly in the interest of time. Uh, but they noted that the claim system provides real-time communication between the central controller and the browser to allow advertisements to be displayed for a set minimum amount of time. So here we're trying to define how long and where this content can be presented. Uh, the patent attempts to address the prevailing problem of advertising uh, on the Internet to control advertising to each web page viewing browser and to monitor accurately the timing of the display with proof of the advertisement display to the paying advertiser. Uh, and noting that this employs a new approach to solve technical problems that did not exist in the conventional advertising realm. And again, I think there they're saying this technology expands the realm of advertising that's not conventional, and this claim is really kind of fundamentally rooted in that technology. Uh, so let's look at the next uh, claim. Now, this one comes out of uh, the PTAB. Uh, this is the ex parte Bush decision uh, where they, again, followed the DDR model. Um, they're looking, at, you know, they found eligibility in view of Alice under 101. Uh, and this had to do with a computer-based communication notification scheme, interconnecting computers, and the claims there, it's, it's fairly long. Um, but, and as I noted before, unlike a lot of the district court decisions, the PTAB tends to be less verbose. Um, here, they simply noted that this subject matter is inextricably tied with a computer-based communication and notification scheme interconnect, interconnecting computers to combine accounts into a single account using computer-associated nodes, which they felt was more than the mere no nominal recitation of a computer to obtain patent eligibility. Uh, so again, this one had uh, less uh, reasoning in it, but the PTAB seemed to find that, look, this, this subject matter that's captured in the claim uh, really um, can't be divorced from the technology. This really, it's reciting more than just this nominal recitation of computers. It couldn't exist without the computers as described, and therefore they pushed it to eligibility. So those are the, oh, actually I actually have one more DDR model case. Uh, this is Google v. Content Garden. This was decided by the PTAB. Uh, this was denial of a CBM, so this wasn't, uh, like some of the other ones, a reversal of an examiner rejection. This was a uh, CBM, Covered Business Method Review, petition that was filed. Um, I believe that the petition was granted with respect to 102 and 103 grounds, but they rejected the petition under 101 grounds. And this actually foreshadowed some subsequent decisions in uh, Content Guard v. Google, which was in the Eastern District of Texas. Uh, both the PTAB here found the claims eligible and the uh, district court in the EDTX uh, found the claims eligible. And this really had to do with uh, digital rights management. Um, and I think, you know, through all the decisions we're seeing, if, if you have claims directed to digital rights management, you're probably in decent shape for uh, eligibility. Um, the decision here uh, noted that, you know, and they, of course, they compared the content guard claims to the DDR claims and said that this, this solution is necessarily rooted in computer technology to overcome a problem specifically arising in, this, uh, to, in the realm of computer networks. Uh, so I don't want to go through too much more because, again, we're getting short on time. I want to—I have a lot of questions coming in that I want to get a chance to answer. Uh, so the slides are here. You can read those. Uh, a couple of the questions that have been asked are, are the slides going to be available? And I probably didn't say that earlier, and I should have, but I'll definitely say at the end, yes, the slides and this whole presentation is being recorded. So you can go back through it. You can have the slides. Uh, those will be, you'll be sent a link uh, after the presentation, either today or tomorrow. Uh, so the slides will definitely be available. Uh, so those were all the DDR model cases that I want to talk about today. Again, there's a lot more. There's a lot more detail to go into each case, and a lot more we can say about each one. And again, I'll be happy after this presentation to, you know, talk one on one about any you know particular questions you may have. Uh, but let's uh, keep moving forward. So now we're going to switch to the Ultramercial slash Alice model. This is going to be your kind of intangible technology as an implementation. This is your hey, I have a business process, and I'm putting it in software, and I'm just having a generic computer execute it. Uh, and so here, where do we find patent eligibility? Uh, it's much more difficult. It's a much higher hurdle. 
And again, as I noted before, uh, we didn't list as many claims under the ultramercial, or sorry, as many cases under the ultramercial model, uh, but there are uh, probably a lot more than under the other models. Uh, and that's, again, because there's so many poor claims out there that are being litigated or that were asserted before Alice that now we're seeing falling under Alice at the PTAB or in the PTO. So many claims and applications written before Alice that are, you know, really having tough times of prosecution, not making out a prosecution, especially if you're in some of the business method uh, art units, the 3600 art units. So the ultramercial model is really, again, based on ultramercial, but Alice uh, just as well. Uh, and this was, ultramercial is really directed to a 11-step method for internet distribution of copyrighted material. So basically the bottom line of, of ultramercial was look, I will give you, I will deliver free content to you over the internet to view as long as you watch this advertisement. So you have to watch an advertisement before you get to see this copywritten material. Um, I think that's akin to what we do every day watching television where you have to watch a commercial before you can see the rest of, of the program you're watching. Um, the method was actually pretty detailed. It did have 11 steps. It was a pretty long claim. Um, but they note that, so, that some of the 11 steps were not previously employed in the art is not enough, standing alone to confer patent eligibility upon the claims at issue. So here, I think what we're pulling out is that even though it's a new and not obvious abstract idea, the idea has some novelty and, and non-obviousness, that's still not enough to be eligible. Uh, we really have to push it to that next level. And here, we're really talking about the kind of technical effects and or lack of preemption, which we're not seeing get a lot of traction in the in the courts, uh, although we do have a couple of decisions more recently that I think are kind of leaning in that direction, which I'll talk about in a minute. But just moving on to the ultramercial model, I just want to talk about the Stone Eagle Services case, which came out earlier, earlier this year in July. This is an interesting one. Uh, they found the cases eligible under 101, uh, and this is really directed to a healthcare provider reimbursement system, uh, such as, uh, you know, by which a payer, such as an insurance company, makes a virtual payment to a medical provider by transmitting a stored value card account payment of the authorized benefit amount together with an explanation of benefits. And so the subject matter here is basically directed to a payor, like an insurance company, actually paying up a bill, um, but they're able to do it through computers without actually printing checks off and mailing checks. And that's kind of the advantage here is that you can do this all electronically without uh, and still have the payment of uh, the explanation of benefits and things uh, all done kind of automatically using the computers. The court found that as one, not having an abstract idea. I was kind of quite surprised, but um, that's how the court found. Uh, the relevant claims stand apart because the claims are different enough in substance from the prior art, so they did a prior art differentiation, and the claims did not merely recite the performance of some prior art business method. I think they noted that the prior art business method was really printing off checks and having statements that had the explanation of benefits, uh, and they leaned on DDR. Uh, I put this in the ultra-mercial model because I think maybe that's really where it fit better given the subject matter. Uh, the court landed on the side of eligibility, but I think this really fits more ultra-mercial, even though they relied on DDR to find that. Uh, they noted that's necessarily rooted in computer technology, just like DDR, um, but arising in the realm of the healthcare industry, which was a little different than DDR. D DDR had, you know, rooted in computer technology in the realm of computer networks. Um, and they also note that the claims didn't instruct the practitioner to implement the abstract idea with routine conventional activity. So they found no abstract idea. They also found no preemption, uh, pushing it to eligibility. Uh, and I'm going to just move along now just because we are running out a little short on time. This is a more recent case that came out last week. Uh, this is the EDECA v3 balls here in the Eastern District of Texas, Texas, excuse me, and they found ineligible under Section 101 of Alice, uh, a method for storing information provided by a user. Uh, I have the claims here. You'll you know, if you just read through the claims, I think the court got it right as far as eligibility or lack thereof. Um, the path they took to get there, though, as I kind of noted, um, you know, the ultra-mercial model, if you have, if, you're, if your claims fit in that model, you're really going to need to rely on step two of Alice, and you're going to need to show that, look, there is one, maybe a technical improvement that we're offering to the to the thing. Yeah, this is an abstract idea, idea encapsulated in software, but we're achieving some technical advantage, some technical improvement, and or a lack of preemption. Uh, this one actually talked about um, technical improvement. Uh, EDECA, who was uh, defending, or you know, these are their claims, they're pushing 
for eligibility. In their pleadings, they contended that the claims are not directed toward an abstract idea because they improve the functioning of technology. They note that there's an improvement to a computer's function because it creates a structure that substantially reduces the time to retrieve information and the amount of information that must be retrieved. I noted that because that really, you know, the abstract idea is less, you know, that's step one, and that's less about, you know, is there some improvement to technology? That's really step two of Alice is when you're looking to save a claim that has an abstract idea, but you're trying to show that it's, you know, not fully preempting or it's offering some improvement to underlying technology. So I think maybe they may have had a better go of this if they had argued the improvement to technology as a step two, as opposed to saying, well, this is an abstract because it improves technology. I don't believe that that's an accurate reflection of, of Alice as a test. Um, so instead, the court concludes that under the first step that this is indeed an abstract idea. So something they also noted, which kind of bothered me a little bit, uh, they, they pointed to the Ariosa case, which is a um, biomed case, a biotech case that came out earlier in the year about preemption. While preemption may signal patent and eligible subject matter, the absence of complete preemption does not demonstrate patent eligibility. I think that first uh, part uh, is kind of, you know, not quite accurate. I mean, claims by definition preempt. So I think the fact that there's preemption shouldn't signal patent and eligible subject matter because that's what claims do. They preempt some use of this, the subject matter that's in the claim. Um, and I wanted to note here that, you know, a lot of courts have kind of given short trips to preemption and then step two of Alice. Um, but I think more recently we're seeing some decisions come out um, that are taking a second look at that. For example, I believe it uh, was the Kronos Tech case a, a decision um, was issued in Kronos Tech denying a motion uh, because they felt that there had to be further development of the factual record to in order to... Um, really develop facts around whether there's preemption or not. So, and that came out of the District of Delaware, which I thought was interesting. Um, so that decision actually in denying the defendant's motion said, hey, you know, we really need to resolve some of these other issues. They, they really kind of pointed to the fact that the, uh, the defendant had failed on a couple other things, but one of the things was that the factual record needed to be further developed to address preemption. Um, so you see things like that, not get, that getting short tripped in some uh, decisions. Uh, but I think the pendulum swinging a little bit where you're going to see some of those uh, other factors like preemption, technical improvement, uh, start getting more traction in the courts uh, as, as uh, claims and patents are kind of washed through the system where we're getting down to more concrete and uh, better better claims uh, that are being challenged. Now, the last one for the ultra-mercial model, I just want to go with the PTAP case quickly. This is Ex parte Wegman. Uh, they found the claims eligible, uh, directed to providing an empirical model of a defined space. This one was one that I kind of scratched my head a little bit, but, you know, the, the PTAB found eligibility. And again, it was a very short uh, decision, as the PTAB decisions tend to be. Um, they note that according to appellant, nothing in these steps may be considered necessary, routine, or conventional in terms of the fundamental abstraction set forth by the examiner. Uh, they the, PTAB agreed with the appellant that claim one not only sets forth the steps emphasized by the examiner, but it further requires these particular calculations and things to be performed and, and ruled that those are sufficiently concrete to set them aside, or set them outside the broad definition of abstract idea. So there they found these claims that were really directed to, to me, a method for providing an empirical model. Um, I, I don't know, on its face, I guess it seems kind of like an abstract idea, um, but this was uh, a appeal from an examiner rejection during examination. Uh, so there you have it. Uh, those are the ultra commercial models. Now I just want to get to the kind of the takeaways of everything I've talked about. Uh, and again, you know, just given the time, we've kind of gone through these at a pretty fast clip, and uh, everything might not be clear why a particular case is in a particular model and how things fit together. Um, I'll be happy to after this, and I'll, again, I'll try to answer as many questions um, as I can. And let me just jump back one slide because I want to make sure everybody caught that. The New York CLE code is 343. That was hidden on this slide. It surprised me too, but I just want to make sure that the, for all the New Yorkers out there, they got that code. Um, so let's talk about the takeaways and really what, what's the whole point of this conversation and what can we take out of this. Um, I think the takeaways are that, you know, looking through this potpourri and, and dividing all, the, all the, the, the leaves and the dried things up into different piles, there's really three 
models or categories or contexts that software inventions tend to fall in. The tangible ones, those are the deer, where you have software as part of the process, but there's some tangible fixed input or output that is providing some real world outcome or input. I was going to say income, but that doesn't make sense. Input or output. Uh, that's going to be your really lowest hurdle for eligibility. As long as you can have claims with that, I think you're going to find yourself in good shape for eligibility. If you're fighting against it, you're trying to prove it ineligible, you might have an uphill battle. Uh, so here, what do we want to do as far as um, you know, claim drafting or, or patent drafting or maybe you know, working through the patent office is you really want to make sure you're claiming some real-world tangible result or input. So in these examples, we have the pressed opened, the door opened, the drill oscillated, in my transmission example, the clutch engaged or disengaged, or again, in the Chamberlain example, the alarm triggered. Have something, some process step, some method step that really goes to that. I think you're going to be in good shape. The next one is our intangible technology as necessity. Uh, this is your DDR model. Um, this, again, I think is the middle hurdle for eligibility. And I think if you can put yourself, whether it's a technological problem you're overcoming or a business problem, again, DDR was really about a business problem. How do I keep visitors on my website? Uh, so if you can you know, squeeze that into uh, and show and establish that like, this technology or this subject matter couldn't exist without this technology. This is a problem, whether it's business or technical, that's unique to this technology. It couldn't have existed before the technology existed, for example. You may be in good shape. Uh, the intangible technology is implementation. That's going to be your tougher category. That's going to be your ultra-mercial slash model where you're really taking a, a business process, for example, is the easiest example, and having it executed by computers, by generic computers. Uh, I think what you're really going to have to go and show are two, a couple things. And you really need to establish this if you're you know, prosecuting the patent, if you're drafting a new patent, or if you're you know, fighting uh, a motion to dismiss in court that, look, the, the, yeah, it's an abstract idea, but it's improving the underlying technology. We have a resource, you know, processors, memory, we're cons conserving this, we're reducing power consumption and or establish that there's no preemption. Again, I think that's getting a bit of short shrift uh, in the courts and even the PTAB right now, but some of the more recent decisions, you kind of see that uh, pendulum swinging the other way. So I would still, for the record, uh, really get in those arguments and make good cases for lack of preemption. Uh, so those are the kind of high-level takeaways. And so now the question is, what about all those other cases, Ryan? We, you, you blasted through a whole bunch here. Uh, you, know, you blasted through a whole bunch here, but we haven't really talked, you know, there's a whole bunch more to talk about. What, what can we do about finding those? Well, what we've done at FISH here is, is uh, develop this Alice Tracker website. Um, it's uh, ff, uh, fr.com slash Alice, and you can go there. It's, I believe it's wide open to the public now as of today. Um, and, you know, as part, how this all developed is, you know, Alice is a huge part, well, software is a huge part of my practice and really impacts my clients uh, in a lot of ways, uh, whether it's, you know, in litigation or in prosecution. And so uh, right from the get-go, I had the library send me alerts. So any day an Alice decision came out, regardless of the court, PTAB, Fed Circuit, whatever, we get that. I have a group of associates that work with me. I'll introduce them in a second. Uh, we summarize those. We've created an internal discussion group here at FISH, and we kick it around to the rest of the firm, and we get a lot of banter back and forth. I guess not banter, but debate, discussion, analysis of the decisions. But we really thought, hey, we need to really have a repository for all this information. So we developed the Alice Tracker website, which is basically a, a source for significant decisions. It's not going to be every Alice decision. We're only really posting ones that we think contribute to the discussion. Uh, those claims that probably should have never been allowed and would have failed under Bilski, you're probably not going to see those decisions on here. Um, but it's going to be all the really kind of substantive decisions where you saw something unique happen or some progress being made towards clarifying what's going on with Alice. So here's a quick screenshot of the Alice Tracker website. You can filter the uh, decisions based on month, year, uh, court, um, category. We try to categorize some. Uh, whether they found an abstract idea, yes or no, whether there was something more. If they did find an abstract idea, was there something more? Uh, and then you can click on those decisions, and you'll get a summary screen of those decisions where representative claims. This doesn't show the whole summary, this, this, uh, this example I'm showing in the slides, but there is more uh, kind of easy reading. There's quotes pulled out of the decision that really are the kind of foundation, all the real important things. So without having to actually go read the full decision, this page will give you a very good overview of what was going on, the context, why the court or the judge decided how they did. 
but then there's also a full link to the decision. So you'll see in the top right corner, if you want to download the decision, it's right there. And I think that's going to be useful for a lot of people. I have a lot of clients call me and say, hey, can you send me this, the copy of this decision? And I can easily get it because I can go to the Alice Tracker website, or I just tell them to go there. Um, and, you know, if, if clients are worried about a particular jurisdiction or a particular judge, some of the functionality that we're, we have planned for this isn't up there. For example, we're going to be able to filter on judge soon. Um, and so if you have a particular judge in a particular jurisdiction and you want to see how they've landed on the, on the Alice side of the fence, you can go to that website. It'll list all the cases if you filter it. And you can get quick summaries of those cases without having to ask now somebody to read through the case and summarize it for you. They're right there. So with that, I think we covered everything. Well, I don't want to say I covered everything I wanted to cover today because there's so much to this. It's such a huge thing that we're talking about constantly, and it consumes uh, all my mornings. Every morning I come in and I get a list of new Alice decisions to read through and decide whether we're going to summarize them and put them up on the website or not or share them with in client alerts and things like that. Um, but I'm not doing it alone. Uh, so I have uh, an associate, Ken Hoover, here in Austin, Michael Shepard in Sill Valley, and Ken Darby here in Austin. And they're really kind of you know helping with this, as I think we all know and appreciate there's a lot going on really fast um, all across uh, you know, various jurisdictions. So, um, so with that, I'm going to jump to the Q&A session. I know, it's, I know we're at 1 o'clock already, and I don't know if there's a hard cutoff, but I would love to answer some of the questions that people have been posting, which I haven't had a chance to. Um, or maybe the operator can tell me if we have a hard stop at now. Um, if so, um, please feel free to contact me or any of my colleagues uh, individually, and, and we're happy to, to reach out to you. Um, this is so the maybe, operator. There is no cutoff. Okay. So if people are around for a minute, I'm, I'm going to be happy to uh, discuss some of the questions. Uh, um, I also just want to note, I noted earlier, if anybody else you know, that, either, that you are aware of that could make it to this, uh, the, the this is recorded and the slides will be available, publicly available, so you'll get a link for that in the next 48 hours or so. Um, if you have any questions regarding CLE credit, uh, you can email Crystal, Crystal Chisholm. Uh, her email address is on the screen. Uh, for those in New York and New Jersey, I think I noted that earlier, it's number 343 for you. Uh, and I think that is about it. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and open up to questions. Um, and maybe we can start with, uh, uh, I'm just going to click through a couple here. I know one, uh, I don't understand how to apply the DDR model um, solution tied to technology to uh, diagnostic method claims. And I think uh, you're right. Uh, this this presentation was actually really geared more towards the software uh, realm, and DDR is really focused on the software space. I wouldn't say that the DDR model is necessarily applicable to the diagnostic uh, method space, um, because there, and, and I'm not a biotech person, so I probably can't talk intelligently on that. Uh, so I can't really provide a, a concrete answer to your question, other than I don't believe that the DDR model, because that's really about software and the necessity for an underlying technology for it to even exist or for the functionality of the software to even exist. Uh, so I don't think it really is germane to the biotech diagnostic uh, case. Uh, let me just click through a couple other questions. Um, why are courts still quoting Fluke? Uh, I think that's a good question. And I think they're quoting Fluke. You'll see a lot of different courts, especially ones that, in my view, are going for ineligibility. They tend to do a nice, long analysis of the progeny of patent eligibility cases that led up to Mayo and Alice. Um, so those are going to be your Deers, your Bensons, your Flukes. Um, and I believe Fluke, if I recall correctly, I can't remember if it was Benson or Fluke. Um, Fluke really just had to deal with uh, calculating alarm li a limit. Uh, so basically, you got some parameters, you calculate an alarm limit, but you didn't do anything with it. And so I think Fluke is maybe uh, one being cited to just as part of that. Hey, let me as a judge, and we're making decisions. Um, you know, let me just kind of lay out, you know, the road for me, the path we traveled to get to here. And I think fluke really stands for if you're just calculating something but not doing anything with it, then you're not going to be eligible. However, that, that kind of actually parallels uh, what we saw in Deer. Deer was, hey, we're calculating something with, you know, calculating something, but now we're doing something with it. There's this tangible output. We're opening our press. I think had fluke, and again, I'm just going by memory. I, I believe fluke was about the alarm limits. 
had Sloop now done something with that alarm limit, like maybe even triggered an alarm when the limit was exceeded, for example, uh, maybe that would have been eligible. Uh, but the the claims didn't go that far. They just went to let's calculate an alarm limit. Uh, but again, I think to answer your question, uh, Fluke is being cited just as part of the progeny of cases that got us to where we are at today. Um, have you considered your three categories with respect to Bilski? Uh, we haven't really. Um, Bilski, you know, obviously is about the machine or transformation test. Um, I guess we have and we haven't. Uh, so the machinery transformation test, I think it's been noted and everybody now understands that, hey, it's not the test for eligibility, but it's a sign along the way. My take on how, where Bilski fits into this now is that in order for your claims to be held eligible regardless of jurisdiction, you need to make sure they actually pass the machinery transformation test. You need to make sure that they aren't something that a court could look at and go, that's just a mental process, you don't even recite a machine. Some of the claims we're seeing fall um, wouldn't even pass Bilski, and some of those decisions, you, they say, look, this doesn't even pass the MOT. We know the MOT is not the test, but this doesn't even pass MOT, and so it's a ding on you uh, for eligibility if you don't even pass MOT. Um, and so uh, I guess, you know, my overall view on Bilski is let's just make sure your claim still, you know, make sure you're reciting some of the hardware. Um, make sure you're, you know, even though it's generic, just make sure that you are setting it up in the environment because that at least gets you past the MOT test. Uh, you don't have to worry about that. Now let's focus on is this fundamentally rooted in computer technology? Is this a DDR model? Is this the ultra-mercial model? And really kind of do your strategy based on what model you think this fits into. Um, I think that's all of the questions other than uh, getting slides. Um, People had a lot of questions about, you know, when the slides will be available, but I think we covered that. So that's all the questions that were sent during uh, the discussion. Um, I don't know if people are able to now ask questions live, or um, if not, I'm happy, you know, feel free to email me. I'm happy to schedule a call and, and go through as many things as I'm able to go through with you. So do, do we have the ability to do live questions? Uh, just one moment. At this time, we will be conducting a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you would like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. One moment, please, while we poll for questions. Once again, if you would like to ask a question, press star 1 on your telephone keypad at this time. It appears we have no phone questions. All right, I got off the hook. Great. All right, well, to anybody that's still on, uh, thank you very much. We appreciate your time, and uh, feel free to reach out. Ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude today's webcast. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you for your participation, and have a wonderful day.